Aside from the most exotic of supercars, there aren't many kinds of car that provoke as much excitement as the humble hot hatch. They give you bonkers speed and everyday usability at an affordable price, and that is a cocktail that is guaranteed to get your heart fluttering. Yet, even among hot hatches, there aren't many more exciting cars than the all-new Ford Focus RS. Over the years, this little RS badge has been worn by some seriously game-changing machinery, making it a symbol of heritage and pedigree and excellence. The question is, can the latest RS live up to the hype? Well, there's only one way to find out. We'll be conducting the biggest hot hatch comparison test ever seen on video. And we'll be starting here at Anglesey Race Circuit in North Wales, where the weather is as unpredictable as our result. Each one of these nine rivals you see behind us are a match for the focus in one aspect or another. Each car will face a series of dynamic tests on track, on road, but ultimately we are looking for one key measure of success. The measure that is the most important aspect for pretty much any hot hatch car buyer, and that is how much fun they are to drive. On that basis, we'll whittle our top 10 down to a final three, and this trio will go on to face a series of challenges. After that, we'll crown one of these 10 our ultimate hot hatch. Anyway, now you know what's occurring, it's time to meet those runners and riders. The new kid on the hot hatch block channels its 345 brake horsepower through a clever new four-wheel drive system and has an adaptive suspension system as standard. Another all-wheel drive contender, and as well as a monstrously powerful five-cylinder engine, the RS3 also packs a classy interior and a prestige badge. The BMW's 3.0-litre engine is the only one in this test with six cylinders rather than four. It's also our only rear-drive contender. Another legendary figure in the hot hatch fraternity, the Type R has always dazzled with its handling, if not always, its raw power. To rectify that, the latest version has upwards of 300 brake horsepower. According to the stats, the A45 has a head start on the rest of the field because it has the most power and the fastest claimed acceleration. Ridiculous name, and in this company, the Peugeot has a ridiculously small 1.6 litre engine. Yet with a barely believable 266 brake horsepower, this thing is still stupidly quick. One of our oldest contenders, but also one of the most dazzling track day hot hatches of recent years. Importantly, the Cup S also has a package of suspension and exhaust upgrades. The Cupra's been around for a little while as well, but Seat has just uprated its 2.0-litre engine to deliver 286 brake horsepower. Admittedly not exactly a hot hatchback, but this rallying legend appeals to the same buyers and simply has to be included in any comparison test that features small performance cars. For when a Golf GTI simply isn't enough. The R takes the legendary GTI's 217 brake horsepower, cranks it up to a whopping 296 brake horsepower, and throws in four-wheel drive for good measure. Ridiculous power and torque means this Ford is fast enough to take on all comers. But it's the trick four-wheel drive system that really makes it feel special. It powers you out of tight corners, but it's pretty frisky if you feel like mucking about too. This car makes a truly brilliant noise and it is undeniably bonkers fast, but it just feels stupidly nose heavy. It's actually more prone to understeer than a lot of our front wheel drive cars and the steering, well, it's just pretty much lifeless. Man, I've got to be honest, it's disappointing. The best thing about this 135i is the creamy turbocharged straight six petrol engine, which doesn't feel turbocharged. You've got this wonderfully linear power delivery and an almighty mid-range, which I admit doesn't feel very hot hatchy. The steering's a bit vague for this rear wheel driver. And whereas most of the cars here like being driven quite aggressively, 
to get the most out of the BMW actually requires smoother, more consistent, more precise inputs. Kind of like you're perfecting your golf swing. The Civic Type R is a really, really angry car. Its engine punches almost as hard as the Focus RS. It fizzes and growls at you all the time and you have to wrestle with the steering wheel to keep it straight sometimes, but it's got the sweetest manual gearbox. It is hard to believe that an engine this powerful and that sounds this good is only a four-cylinder. It is nothing short of phenomenal. And so is the way that this car hangs onto the road around the corners and the way it puts its power down on the way out. It is super impressive. GTI may only have a turbocharged 1.6 litre petrol engine, but it is a short of fizz and verve and is hugely entertaining. The trouble is, in this company, it actually feels the least grippy here. You're constantly having to mediate the throttle to ensure that you're maintaining maximum traction and you're not torque steering all over the place. And the gear change just doesn't have the mechanical definition of the Civic Type R. The Megan RS feels perfectly at home here on track. It's got the sweetest chassis, razor sharp steering, and it's light too. It feels like it's got a real motorsport pedigree. The layout really is the surprise package in this test. It is a very easy car to drive seriously quickly because of all the confidence you get from all the controls. Also, there is real polish in the way that this car turns and stops and goes. It is no shortage of fun, let me tell you. This Subaru feels like such a nod to those good old days of, of rally specials. I think I drove one of these for the first time about 10 years ago, and this thing just doesn't feel any different. And while that will be quite romantic and appealing for, for the hardcore few, I've got a feeling for the majority of people, this thing's gonna feel pretty dated, with a cabin that's noisy, a turbo that's laggy, and a ride quality that's pretty firm and bouncy. You really can have your cake and eat it with this Golf R. It's as easy to drive and refined as any Golf you'll find, but it comes alive when driven hard, with brilliant traction and composure out of corners, and an engine that's super smooth and a joy to rev out. We know how you lot love to pour over the stats, to compare and contrast all the numbers in all their minute detail. So if you want to see a table of all our performance figures, then hit your pause button right about now. Happy? Good. Okay, chat, so bear in mind that our performance figures are purely for guidance at the moment, and at this stage, we are judging these things purely on fun. What do we think? Biggest disappointment for me has got to be the RS3. One of the most expensive cars here. It sounds great, it's so powerful, but I mean, in the wet, the understeer is unbelievable and just the gearbox is too slow and the steering just doesn't really give you any feel through the front end. You could imagine driving that on a dry road on an autobahn and it being so sure-footed and comfortable at 100 miles an hour and stuff, but we had access to wet roads and it really come unstuck. Don't disagree with any of that. Yeah, Reed. As much as I love it and the way it looks, I think the Subaru should be next. It feels to me like a car from a bygone age. It um, is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's been true. around since the mid-90s and it hasn't changed a whole hell of a lot and it just needs muscling everywhere. The steering, the control weights, that truck-like gear shift. Probably the Peugeot 308 GTI is going to be next for me. Yeah. It was quite good fun in the dry, actually. I was a bit surprised. The engine's brilliant, but the ergonomics of the cabin and 
the way it understeers in the wet, I think probably have to rule it out. Another car that was really exposed in the wet, actually, was the Honda Civic Type R. In the dry, yes. that thing is raucous and fun and angry and really entertaining, but in the wet, the steering was just so corrupted. You know, you just, you didn't have any feel. It was torque steering, it was tram lining. It honestly felt that sometimes like it wanted to throw you into a hedge. It's a lesson in how much power you can put through a front wheel drive car and mm. probably in that case too much. That BMW has one of the finest engine and gearbox combinations yeah. of anything at this money. It is wonderful and it is a lovely car to drive. But in this company for a hot hatch buyer it's just a bit too sophisticated. It's more like a GT car than it is a hot hatch. I yeah. don't think it quite hits the mark. What about the Leon? I mean, that was a bit of a surprise package for me. Absolutely. I really enjoyed like how composed it felt at high speeds, how good it was on turning, and it's still only a, a front-wheel drive car, and the engine was the, such a dominant player in that. The grip well. and the control weights were fantastic, Absolutely. and that engine's yeah. really smooth. I think for me, though, when you get down to just those two front-wheel drive cars, it's got to be the Renault, hasn't it? Yeah. No I think, question. I think the Renault that's is... That's staying where it is. Yeah, Definitely that's staying where it is. On the board. Four cars left, three spots left. Megane has to stay in our last three. Don't it's, disagree. It, it was the best Bet front-wheel driver that we had here. Probably um, one of the best chassis, regardless of the way it's driven. Absolutely. And this and is a bit of an old boy. It's, it's very much an old boy. Uh, been around a good slice of time, but that chassis still has the sparkle to cut it with any of the newer cars here. It feels light, it feels adjustable, and just the steering's so good as well. It's Yeah, it's about the balance, isn't it? Because it kind of proves that you don't need to be going to chase like high horsepowers necessarily to create a great hot hatch. Yeah. Mm. So that's nailed on. I propose that the next spot in the top three go to the new boy, the Focus. It is sensationally fast. It's It, it looks the absolute business, but it's so much more than that. The grip on that car, whether you're on the circuit or around the track, whether in the wet, whether in the dry, it allows you to take tighter lines than you thought possible. It's all about fun. I think the focus stays in the top three. Yeah. So we've got one spot left. Who are we giving it to? I mean, they're so different, aren't they? The Golf R was amazing. It, it, it actually embarrassed the Audi RS3 at 15 grand. Absolutely. You know, it's cheaper. Absolutely. It behaves like you want a four-wheel drive car to behave, but at the same time, there were some, some moments where I actually felt I wasn't really part of the experience. I didn't really feel that, that connected, that involved. I felt like my mum could drive it just as quickly as, as I could drive it. Yeah, I've seen your driving, so... Well, there you go. And, <laughs> but when you compare that to the Merc, then that was a bit of a surprise package, to be honest, mm. because it was just savage. I mean, I think that's the fastest thing that's we had. That's a very good word for it. I couldn't stop taking it out on track, which no. I think is probably a good sign when it comes to a hot hatch. I just the way it sounds, I love the way it looks, and it just was so aggressive feeling, but not uncomfortable like it used to be. I think for me, I think it's just got that edge. Whereas the Golf, like you said, it's really good, but the gearbox doesn't always work with you when you want it to on track, and it just feels that bit more ponderous on turning. I think it's a brilliant all-rounder, but out and out fun, I think the golf goes. When I'm thinking about what car I want to drive tomorrow, what car I want to learn more about, they're all on the left-hand side of that board. Mm. So we're saying farewell to the Volkswagen Golf Art. I think yeah. we are. That's our top three, gents. So now we have our final three, it's time to leave this wonderful circuit and head north to complete the remainder of our tests. Before we do leave, however, it's time to conduct the first of them, and that is a good old-fashioned drag race. Why? Well, firstly because we can, and secondly because it's important to know which of these cars is likely to give you the bragging rights when you inevitably find yourself in your own traffic light Grand Prix. So let's get ourselves under starter's orders. Our first stop is the Dinorweg Hydroelectric Power Station in Flamberes, otherwise known as Electric Mountain. 
Water flows through a dam in the reservoir at the top, through Europe's largest man-made cavern and six different generators, before pouring out here into the Lynn Paris Reservoir. The question is, why have we come here to this dam slash power station to test the affordability of these cars? Well, if money is your biggest barrier to owning one of these things, then we thought we'd work out exactly how much you'd need to spray up against a wall in the pursuit of raw power. I think it's fair to say from the off that the Mercedes is probably the weakest in this area. Even going on the base prices alone, it'll cost you £10,000 more than the Ford and 16 more than the Renault. And that's before you've delved into the extensive options list. It does have strong residuals, but the knee trembling numbers continue when you look at insurance or PCP finance, both of which will cost you hundreds of pounds more than the other two every single year. It's a shame because allegedly this A45 is actually the cleanest car here with the lowest CO2 and best economy. Although at the track we did record a uh, 9.7 MPG, so it's probably best to drive with a light right foot if you can. Whichever way you cut it, it seems like the Ford is a bit of a performance bargain and the tax and insurance are virtually identical. Focus RSs of old have always traditionally held their value really well and with a current waiting list of nearly a year for this car, we don't see that changing much this time around. Bear in mind that you're probably going to want to add the Recaro seats and the forged 19 inch alloy wheels on this car which both cost a grand. Those wheels do come with a free set of stickier Michelin Pilot Cup Sport tyres. Having said that, they're not cheap to replace. On paper at least, this new Renault Sport Megane Cup S, Cups, whatever you want to call it, seems like a complete steal. The best ever handling front wheel drive hot hatch for less than £24,000. Surely that can't be right. This shockingly low figure includes aircon, but precious little else. We really think if you want to get the best out of this car, you're probably going to want the very pricey, optional, adjustable Olin's dampers and maybe the Recaro seats, Alcantara interior and R-Link infotainment system. Oh, and if you want it to look as good as this car, then you're also going to want to put aside 600 quid for this flame red paint and about £1,000 for these 19-inch Speedline alloy wheels. However, if you just want to get into this car at the lowest possible price, then bin all that off and just buy yourself a Garmin instead. To Norway, we head north through some absolutely jaw-dropping countryside and then plan to turn east onto the A55 North Wales Expressway. It's all very well dazzling on the track, but it's here on the Great British B Road where a good hot hatch really has to shine. And by crikey, is this Focus a shiny little devil. The turbocharged 2.3 litre engine doesn't quite have that boosty turbo nutter feeling that you might expect. The power delivery is actually pretty constant throughout the rev range, but one thing's for sure, it never feels anything but absolutely ferocious. And if you hook up the standard launch control, there aren't many cars at any money that can stay with you away from the lights. Don't be tempted to select race mode on the public highway because it firms up the adaptive dampers by a full 40% and the ride becomes too harsh for even the most dedicated hot hatch fan. The standard setting is firm but tolerable and it provides all the control you need for some seriously agile handling. The instantaneous responses you get from the throttle, the powerful brakes, the fast feelsome and beautifully weighted steering all help make this car wonderfully involving to drive. But it's that four-wheel drive system that really weaves all the magic. It juggles the power around to give you barely believable amounts of traction and grip. And combined with the active torque vectoring, you can drive through and out of corners at frankly insane speeds. All the while, it feels edgy and alive and really very, very exciting. And while the RS does all that regular hot hatch stuff exceptionally well, it then has drift mode on top of that. This sends more power to the rear wheels and optimizes the things like the steering, the dampers, the traction control to have you sliding sideways in smoky, spectacular fashion. Is it perfect? No. The driving position is way too high, the boot's a bit small, and apart from a bit of blue stitching, this cabin 
makes you feel like you could be sitting in any old focus. It's just not special enough. But once you get it wound up and pounding along, you are not going to give up monkeys about any of that. Once we hit the North Wales Expressway, it's not long before we get to the Conwy Tunnel, the site of our next challenge. Essentially, it's a road surrounded on all sides by several thousand tonnes of concrete and rock for the engine noise to ricochet off, so there's no other place for miles around that will make these cars sound better. Trade up between it's two thousand five hundred pounds. <laughs> but it's so it better sound pretty design. good, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's go. I'll just warm it up. Yeah. There, there we go. go. There hey. go. All right. All right. Tunnel coming up. Right, okay. Bit of space. Hey. Hey. All right. It sounds great at the top end. I always remember this car sounded really good at high revs. But you got to keep it up there. Haven't you? Shifts on demand. So what are we thinking? Oh, go on. This is very different to the Focus. It's, it's not as loud. I like, I like it though. Nowhere near in some loud. ways I prefer it. No, it's I not as loud. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I prefer the tone of the Focus under normal circumstances. Yeah. yeah. But I like the way that this is more easy to, to provoke a pop. I'd say a 7 on par with the Focus. Yes. Right? But with an asterisk saying, but that costs you two and a half. Hours. Yeah. It's got an exhaust button. Yeah. And these modes are new. Oh, oh, like it, that's actually my brake in my seat. Come on. <laughs> this sounds gun shitty. This is. Excuse me, my hit the limit. This is angry, man. This is, this is <laughs> much angrier than the focus. And then on the downs. It's like you're being flanked by a couple of Chinook helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is so much louder, this thing. Back down. There we go. Oh. It feels way more exhaust than the heavy though, doesn't it, than the other two? I think the other two are better balanced between engine and exhaust. I mean, this the noise is ridiculous. I think the thing is, on, on, the, on the B roads as well, like, you know, when you're always in second and third gear corners, so you're always going between second and third and getting that crack. But not, nice. not only is the noise amazing, it's really controllable as well. Yeah, you can, yeah. you can, you're doing it all the time. Yeah. You're not just suddenly having it come every now and then. Yeah. It's like playing an instrument, isn't it? I don't think I'd turn that button off. No. What, <laughs> were, what were we doing this then out of 10? Eight? It's, it's definitely there. It's, it's nine. It's, for me, winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> The A45 AMG might be the fastest, most powerful hot hatch there is, but this facelift has transformed it from a clinical exercise in one-upmanship into something so much better. Now, the extra power and torque, they're mainly for bragging rights, but it's the subtler, smaller changes that have had the bigger impact. The seven-speed DCT gearbox used to really strangle the savage delivery of this engine. It was hesitant too, but the shorter ratios and the crisper shifts in this new refreshed box mean that every pull of the paddles is a real event. They might both have four-wheel drive and bootfuls of power and traction, but to 
very different car to drive on the road compared to the Focus RS. The steering is lighter and certainly less feelsome, but the chassis underneath is so brilliant that you soon realise it'll just grip and go, even if you can't always feel what those front tyres are up to. The body control is unbelievable. The chassis is so stiff that fast direction changes can be dealt with with a single flick of the wrists. And then you're back on the power, urging this monster of an engine forward. It was imperious in wet weather on track, but any concern that that unflappable nature would translate to boredom on the road pretty much evaporates in an instant as soon as you start to wind this thing out. It is firm, particularly without the new adaptive dampers. However, it's no more uncomfortable than the Focus at low speed, and it settles into this nicely contained squat when you're driving on fast roads like this, which means that even the most vicious bumps are unlikely to throw you offline. It does feel heavier than the other two, I'll admit that. Particularly when you're driving downhill, you feel the weight in the body. You have to push the brakes to get the nose to turn in sharply. If you do though, it swings around in a nice predictable arc. Let's confront the elephant in the room though. This car is expensive, but it feels expensive too. It's got the best seats of any car here. This gorgeous steering wheel and gear selector are borrowed straight from the AMG GT. Some of the plastics down below are a little less impressive. You could argue that the RS and the Megane, they're more involving, they keep you busier at the wheel, but this thing is so devastatingly quick, absolutely everywhere, that it creates an excitement all of its own. Having busted through the border, we've traded Wales for Wembley, kind of, as we head for our next test. Part of the beauty of cars like this is that you can live with them every day and for the average hot hatch car buyer, they must have enough space to take you and your mates to five a side footy on a Thursday night. They need to be easy enough to get in and out of so you don't strain any muscles before you hit the pitch and they need to have a big enough boot to accommodate everybody's kit bag. The thing is, we're not that good at football. So for this test, we've enlisted the help of some friends with much better techers. So fellas, here are your trophies. If it's based purely on practicality, which of these three cars would you choose to arrive to the five-a-side football in with your mates? Okay, so that is the Mercedes A45 AMG. Paul wins that one. And how about second place for practicality? The Focus RS. Ivan gets that, so Thank I'm you. guessing the FA Cup goes to me. Thanks, boys. You've earned it, mate. I'm always the blimmin' last one to get picked. I'm sorry, but you'd have to be an absolute mug to spend upwards of 40 grand on a hatchback, regardless of how hot it is. And thanks to Renault Sport, you really don't need to. The Cup S is the final curtain on this generation of McGann and it features all the best bits from Renault Sport's development, including a turbocharged two litre petrol engine, upgraded to 271 brake horsepower. It's got a stiffer cup chassis, a limited slip differential to help that front end turn in even more keenly, firmer springs, stiffer anti-roll bars, and our test model also features the optional, but simply brilliant Olin's road and track dampers paired with a set of pretty special 19 inch alloys. And this car starts at just under 24 grand. To put that into some context, that's a whole entire ordinary Megane cheaper than the Mercedes. But the best bit about this car is the inherent rightness of every single element. The engine, the chassis, the steering, the driving position, even the way it looks. I really love the fact that no single area is overshadowed by another. 0-62 miles an hour takes 6 seconds flat, 
but the composure of the chassis is just sublime and you get so much detailed feedback through this steering wheel that you feel really confident in carrying so much more speed through the corners when the other two cars are in fact back on the brakes. It's only when you get to really big straights where the Megane starts to lose touch. I don't doubt that other hot hatches are more refined at high speeds or easier to live with on the daily commute. But if you're thinking about simple driving purity and sheer engagement, then this thing is a match for pretty much any car on the road. And remember, this is probably your last chance to buy what is arguably one of the finest hot hatches of this decade. Never mind this test. As our convoy rolls ever further northward, we've now reached Manchester, the final stop on our tour. However, before we deliver our final verdict, we have one more test to conduct. Obviously, you want your hot hatch to deliver as much clout from its looks as it does from its engine. But looks are a very personal thing. And who are we to decide which one of these cars is prettiest? So what we need is a good old-fashioned consensus of opinion. Basically, we're going to ask the good people of Manchester to cast a vote for which car they think looks best. And the winner is the one with the most votes. Simple. So the votes have been counted and verified, and I can now reveal that the Renault Megane scored six, six <laughs> of the Queen's votes. Well done, Renault. Manchester, I am disappointed. <laughs> the Ford Focus RS, 20 votes. Not bad. Thank you, Manchester. But once again, the Mercedes A45 AMG, 36 votes. It's another win for the Mercedes, well done, well done, Mercedes. and another loss for the Renault. But remember that the final decision lays with us, so it could still go either way. Well, we've done several hundred miles and a variety of different things. We've indulged in a spot of tunnel running, we've been completely humiliated at football, and we visited a power station built inside a mountain, one of the most incredible feats of engineering you'll find anywhere in the UK. Speaking of incredible feats of engineering, we've taken 10 of the finest hot hatches on sale and whittled them down to our top three. All three are, believe us, in their own way, truly sensational. But now, it's time to reveal which is best. If anything, the Renault Sport Megane will be the most appealing of the lot to the committed hot hatch purist. The finesse of the chassis and the clarity of the steering help make it one of the most engaging performance cars you can buy at any price. And the fact it's so cheap just makes it more accessible to a bigger chunk of the population. Unfortunately, its comparative shortage of power and performance held it back on track, as did its shortage in practicality, in refinement and standard equipment. That just consigns it to third place. The AMG combines jaw-dropping speed with sure-footed handling. It's well worthy of a place in our top three as an example of a hot hatch that's as fast and desirable as most sports cars and turns heads like one too. It sounds epic and feels really special inside, which helps justify the high price. It pushed hard for the win, but ultimately was undone. Not by the money, but by the fact that despite the extra performance, it was just a tenth of a second quicker than the focus on our track. And the numb steering and extra weight that it carries held it back on a B-Road blast where it really counts. This car completely rewrites the hot hatch rulebook. It proves that you can have the monstrous power output that four wheel drive allows you, but you can indeed combine it with the involvement and engagement of the sharpest front drivers. Fast, fluid and unfailingly exciting, this car has proven itself in all weathers, on all sorts of road and against all of its rivals. Quite simply, the Ford Focus RS is 
the finest hot hatch money can buy. Oh yes, the RS legend most definitely continues. Thank you for watching to the end. You've clearly got a longer than average attention span and we salute you for that. If you've enjoyed what you've just seen, then hit the subscribe button to see our YouTube channel and more videos just like this one. If you want to watch what goes into making a film like this, then you can click the box at the top right of your screen now. Or if you want to watch another group test video featuring the BMW 3 Series, Jaguar XE and Mercedes C-Class, you can hit the box at the bottom right. And then there's the big question. Do you agree with our verdict? Do you think we've gone stark raving bonkers or are you an aggrieved Type R owner with an axe to grind? Well, leave us a comment in the box below to let us know what you think.